morning. Wow. I didn't think that was going to work. Uh, to our Pfeiffer family and our friends, welcome to the second installment of the Eugene I. Earnhardt Speaker Series. My name is Michael Thompson, and I serve as the Dean of the Undergraduate College and longtime professor of American history. In the winter of 2000, when I returned to North Carolina to interview for Pfeiffer's opening in the history program, before I ever came to campus, I was ushered to New London, to the Earnhardt home for a conversation with Jean. I was too nervous to remember any of the details of that evening, save for the warm welcome to Stanley County. I was struck the next morning during my teaching demonstration when I noticed that Gene had positioned himself near the back of the Jane Freeman 200 classroom. Note he had been retired for four years. I came to realize how invested he was in the academic experience of Pfeiffer students. Even in retirement, he was conducting quality control on behalf of the student body. Looking back, I feel fortunate to have passed that early test and to have developed a friendship with Gene over the years. In his tenure as the American historian at Pfeiffer University beginning in 1966, Eugene Earnhardt was notable for challenging his students to think beyond the confines of their texts and the classrooms where they studied. He demanded that they apply the historical context they were considering to the world as it was taking shape around them. He pushed them to consider aspects of the past and present that they may not have noticed nor have been aware of. This speaker series has its origins with this in mind. In the wake of Gene's death in January 2020, members of his family, including his wife Barbara, former writing professor at Pfeiffer, began conversations to consider how we might honor his legacy. The family's generous donations of time and treasure have made this possible, and we are eternally grateful. Before I ask Dr. Bullard to come up and introduce today's speakers, uh, a few announcements for us. Uh, as has been custom in these sorts of events, please take a moment to check and then silence your phones, if you will. And for those students, any of you who have 11 o'clock classes, be assured that I have noticed, uh, notified your instructors to allow you to enter your classes without being counted tardy or absent, should we run over time. So please, 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 don't leave early. So thank you in advance for all of you who have made the choice to attend today. Uh, we always appreciate our guests from the com community who've made the trip uh, to Meisenheimer as well as our friends from Greystone Day School. Welcome to the village. Uh, I'd like to add uh, one more uh, personal note uh, before we begin the program. Uh, many of you will remember uh, Ed Kelly, Pfeiffer graduate Ed Kelly. Uh, Ed uh, wanted to hear Dr. Candler uh, very, very much uh, today. Uh, in fact, um, uh, he, uh, he and I had a personal conversation about this about six weeks ago. Um, Ed, uh, who graduated from Pfeiffer in the 60s and is perhaps the most famous uh, history teacher uh, to graduate from Pfeiffer, uh, especially in the Charlotte area, taught for Charlotte Country Day uh, for decades, uh, passed away last week. Uh, and Ed was another one of those uh, Earnhardt, uh, Thompson, Candler types uh, who stretched his students. Uh, a moment of silence for Ed Kelly. Thank you. It's my privilege uh, to introduce to you uh, a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Peter Candler, 
Uh, I could read to you from his website uh, uh, about his degrees from Wake Forest and Cambridge, about his teaching at Duke University and Baylor University, uh, and those are great and well-funded schools uh, where lots of good things happen, a lot of good history and religion and culture are taught. Um, but I, I'll just uh, have a more personal intro today. Uh, I first saw Peter Candler, I believe, in the spring of the year 2000 uh, in a classroom at Duke University. I was fresh out of rural eastern North Carolina, and he was fresh uh, off of a graduate experience in England, uh, having uh, been raised in Atlanta. He had a, a long navy blue coat on, and what I thought was a funny hat. Funny hat. Dark spectacles. And he might as well have been from the moon, uh, as far as I could tell, uh, based, uh, and that, that was my upbringing, not his, right? But as he taught us church history, uh, I noted his care. I noted the precision with which he wanted us to remember and write. I noticed his markings, his thorough markings on my paper. Uh, they were thorough, certainly, but they were not condescending. It was as though friendship, honest friendship, where the student hears hard truths about his or her writing, uh, was part of his approach to teaching. Later, uh, Pete and I, uh, whether through fate or providence, uh, both wound up at Baylor University in Texas, uh, a Baptist school uh, there that you may have heard of. Um, that, I suppose, was an interesting part of the journey for Pete, uh, an Atlantan, uh, accustomed to formal worship, accustomed to formal liturgy. Um, and in many ways, it was a stretch for me, too. A little bit about our speaker. We learned that Pete had taught himself Latin so that he could teach a seminar, a PhD seminar, on 12th, 13th century theologian Thomas Aquinas. Uh, later, uh, we learned, or at least the claim was made, uh, that he was the only non-Baptist ever allowed to direct a dissertation, a doctoral dissertation in the Department of Religion, uh, a dissertation on the theology of prayer, uh, on the theology of a French Catholic person. These things are uh, what I most want to convey to you this morning, uh, I think because it's tempting for us to see things like Latin and Catholicism and the 12th and 13th centuries uh, as totally disconnected, totally disparate from what you will see and hear about today, uh, the South, photography, race, the refusal to take interstate highways on road trips, because they tend to bypass our country's small towns and the gifted and complex people therein. And yet, as Martin Luther King knew and illustrated in his letters from a Birmingham jail, as the great Southern author Flannery O'Connor knew, uh, as she read Thomas Aquinas every night of her life as an adult, uh, this large round monk from the 1200s, uh, who lived 700 years before she was born, quoting extensively in 1200 uh, an African theologian uh, who lived 700 years before he was born, St. Augustine, uh, who often quoted prophets from the Old Testament who lived 700 years before he was born. And so it goes. Students, I hope you enjoy the opportunity you have before you today. Uh, a thinker, a scholar, a writer uh, asking new questions or asking ancient questions through new lenses, through lenses uh, like photography, uh, short essays, podcasts. 
These things are being faithfully used to reveal beauty, a unique culture, the problem of race, and they are doing so in a way that I think Aquinas and the prophets would have loved. Uh, they illuminate the way in which we are all knit together. I'm so proud to introduce my friend, uh, Dr. Peter Camp. I feel like I just won an Oscar. <laughs> thank you. Um, I want to thank uh, Scott for initiating this invitation and uh, for everybody who helped bring it about, Michael, Danny, and especially Mrs. Earnhardt, the Earnhardt family for the great generosity in funding this series. Um, the one regret I have this morning is that I didn't get to know Gene Earnhardt. He sounds like uh, an amazing person. I hope I do him justice this morning. Um, and again, thank you all for being here. I, I, uh, it's a bit of a mixed blessing to be invited to give this lecture, having heard such uh, wonderful stories about Professor Earnhardt and my predecessor, Carlotta Walls Lanier. Um, I cannot pretend to approximate her wisdom and depth of personal experience. But I'll at least say that what I want to say here this morning belongs to the same range of concerns as Mrs. Lanier in her call at the conclusion of her speech in this room to this august body one year ago, quote, to channel Jean Earnhardt, know your history and your country's history. If I can begin, with a little anecdote of my own about your president. Uh, about four years ago this time, I was in Marion, Alabama, documenting the residency of a troupe of female movement artists from Atlanta called GLOW, led by Lori Stallings. I have no experience in this field. I didn't know what I was getting into. I didn't know much about GLOW. I didn't know much about Marion. One of the things I did not know about Marion is, is that it was home to Judson College, a now shuttered Baptist institution of higher learning. Among the many things I didn't know about Judson in 2019, at least until shortly before I went, was that Scott Bullard was its president. Scott arranged to put me up in the president's mansion, a huge house way too big for one person, although I will say this was my roommate. Uh, <laughs> charming young woman um, who hung on the wall. Scott arranged for me to, to hang out with her for a week, which was really slightly disturbing. But it, it, did, it did contribute to the sense, uh, overarching sense of capaciousness that characterized one of the most extraordinary weeks of my life. Because of that experience, I remain, uh, I, I have a deep attachment to Marion and its people. In fact, I could devote the remainder of my time this morning to nothing but what has grown out of some very dense and rich hours in Marion and still approach the theme I want to address with you today. My present work is very place specific. It has grown out of the experience of being in particular places at particular times and the weird revelations that can emerge from those highly contingent moments. We talk of spending time as if it is a fungible good to be used up, but my time in Marion was less spent than entered into, as into an almost alternative order of reality in which time slows and stretches out. On my first day of that residency in Marion in 2019, I attended a performance of a play entitled Jimmy Lee, by playwright, poet, and professor at Judson, Billie Jean Young. In 1965, civil rights worker James Orange was arrested in Marion and held in the county jail for uh, contributing to the delinquency of minors. Peaceful protests in February of that year from the Zion United Methodist Church to a block away to the Perry County Jail where Orange was held, ended in bloodshed 
after local law enforcement abruptly turned off all the lights and began beating the demonstrators. In the chaos of that dark night, Jimmy Lee Jackson was murdered by an Alabama state trooper. The episode led directly to the formation of the Selma to Montgomery voting rights marches that took place the following month in March of 1965. Standing next to that jail cell with Billie Jean Young in Marion, as you can see here, I was struck by the fact that the most historically oppressed portion of American society has been the most vocal in defense of a vision of one nation. The race most victimized by the nation's highest crimes has been the most ardent collective voice in defense of its highest ideals. Black Americans have for generations been trying to tell the rest of us what is wrong with America in a largely nonviolent mode of discourse whose enduring patience, frankly, staggers the mind. And the typical reaction of the majority of white Americans has often been defensive, resentfully nostalgic to long for the quote old time Negro who accepted his lot with cheerful gratitude for being lifted up from savagery. The community in America that is most justified in its skepticism of American words has typically been the one most diligently holding American culture and politics to them. As Albert Murray wrote in 1970, it is the political behavior of black activists, not that of norm calibrated Americans, that best represents the spirit of such constitutional norm ideals as freedom, justice, equality, fair representation, and democratic processes. Murray's Tuskegee classmate, Ralph Ellison, wrote in the same year that, quote, it is the black American who puts pressure upon the nation to live up to its ideals. I would love to dwell with you this morning in Marion, but today I want to begin in a different place, namely in Washington, D.C., on the western front of the United States Capitol on January 6, 2021. The smoke had barely cleared the Capitol steps before the old familiar refrain began circulating in halls of power and in press rooms and from Twitter accounts around the country, quote, this is not who we are. I was reminded of one of many famous and oft-repeated anecdotes from the theologian Stanley Horowitz, who said, he used this example quite frequently, when Tonto and the Lone Ranger found themselves surrounded by 20,000 Sioux, the Lone Ranger turned to Tonto and said, this looks pretty tough. What do you think we ought to do? Tonto replied, what do you mean we, white man? <laughs> Harawas calls this the Tonto principle. And while he puts it to a, quite a different use, it's worth asking, when we say this is not who we are, who is the we here? Is anyone still bold enough to say that there is a single we in American life? It is not a new question. In one of his final essays, James Baldwin recalls burying his father in Harlem with the help of Buford Delaney. He writes, this was in 1943. We were fighting the Second World War. We, who was this we? It is perhaps the most loaded and yet casually weaponized word in the American vocabulary. The American experiment begins with it, after all. When the United States Constitution was drafted in 1787, the we of its first sentence plainly did not include everyone. The collectivity implied in we the people has always been an aspirational polity. And today as ever, it remains an increasingly impossible ideal yet to be achieved. It certainly will never be achieved so long as the recognition of the inherently contradictory history of our, de our ideals and their practice is postponed, so long as anyone who still wants to claim the, world, the word we for the American project pretends that violence, white supremacy, a talent for forgetfulness, and the lust for domination do not in some sense make us who we are. The events of January 6th were not an exception to who we are. They were a revelation 
of who we are. Sort of. The claim that this is who we are is true, but not equally true for everyone. If you were to tell a native or black American that the story of violent conquest, white supremacy, predatory capitalism, and colonialism are who we are, don't be surprised if you are met with the response, what do you mean we, white man? And yet, there are less anthologized Americas too. Not other alternative ones, but less celebrated parts of the bold experiment whose precarious existence even now remains simultaneously bleak and promising. As always throughout our history, it has been that portion of our population who has the least reason to believe in the American promise who keeps calling the rest of us back to it. And yet, on Issaquina Avenue in Clarksdale, Mississippi, one hot July afternoon, a black man in overalls, Oxford shirt, and white brimmed Stetson hat pulled up to a stop in the middle of the road as John, my collaborator on 25 years worth of Southern tours with a film camera, John and I were taking pictures. How y'all like my beautiful town, he asked. He introduced himself as the Brick Man, gave us his card showing a brickwork portrait of MLK and began an impromptu sermonette on the need for love and mutual respect. The brick man had nothing to gain from us. He could have assumed justifiably that we two balding bearded white men were not worth the effort and might have not even had the best motives. And yet he didn't. He urged upon us the need to stick up for each other. He used the word we a lot. James Baldwin wrote that we have already paid a tremendous price for what we've done to the Negro people. By we, he does not, of course, mean black Americans principally. He was speaking boldly in the persona of the collective as a whole. And the evocative range of his we is as wide as we the people. Baldwin affects a sort of reverse adoption. The price of racism is paid in one especially acute way by its victims and another way by its perpetrators. His adoption of the American tradition and its claim and claims to reverse the legacy by which black citizenship was refused, denied, hedged, obstructed by proposing a vision of Americanness as constituted by the recognition of American sin and its ravaging effects on both oppressor and oppressed. He also refused that dominion of the American imagination wherein there were only victims and not agents. Witnesses are objects of American history and not its creators as well. The possibility of any future depends upon learning from Baldwin's example. Given our national history, he had little compelling reason to advocate the American we, and yet. Especially we white Americans who love to recall the words of Martin Luther King Jr. on the footsteps of the Lincoln Memorial. This will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning and so forth. But forget the next line. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. King understood that this was not true. Not yet in 1963. It is certainly not yet true 60 years later and might always not yet be true. What the idea of the beloved community borrowed from the Christian idea of the kingdom of God on earth as the earthly reality of the inbreaking heavenly kingdom is an anticipation of an eternal communion, not its final realization. It is not only a possible, but a real, if not complete realization of the kingdom, which is now and not yet, which comes to genuine fruition in restored human and social relationships, but which remains a never fully accomplished state of affairs to which we could pretend to return again. Two weeks after the violent din of chaos subsided on the Capitol, that voice from the western end of the National Mall seemed to reverberate from its opposite side when an old refrain began to become audible once more. In his now canonical 1935 poem, Langston Hughes articulated this idea with fierce grace. Oh, let America be America again, the land that has never been yet. 
and yet must be. The land where every man is free. The land that's mine, the poor man's, the Indians, Negroes, me, who made America, whose sweat and blood, whose faith and pain, whose hand at the foundry, whose plow in the rain must bring back our mighty dream again. If there is a proposed restoration in Hughes's poem, it is not of a political or sta social status quo. It is a reinvigoration of the imagination, the constant revivification of an idea and a land that is morally compromised and yet full of possibility. Out of the rack and ruin of our great gangster death, the rape and rot of graft and stealth and lies, we the people must redeem the land, the mines, the plants, the rivers, the mountains and the endless plain, and all the stretch of these great green states, and make America again. What Hughes does not say is make America America again, much less make America great again. He does not even say remake America again. The subtle grammatical elision at the end of his poem contains possibly the work's greatest moment of wisdom, make America again. Hughes calls the reader, us, back to an original vocation that he understands may never be fully realized. It certainly has not for black and brown and native citizens. And not just for themselves alone, but for all the peoples whose lives and humanity have been diminished by white lust for power. And yet, they may be the most significant and loaded two words in this present context. In his poem entitled Inaugural for the New Yorker on this same day, Jericho Brown on night 20th of January 2021. Jericho Brown echoes Langston Hughes. We were told that it is dangerous to touch, and yet we journeyed here, where what we believe meets what must be done. His echo of Hughes continues, we imagine an impossible America and call one another a fool for doing so. In her own celebrated inaugural poem the same day, Amanda Gorman invoked the same language. When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never ending shade? The loss we carry, a sea we must wade. We have braved the belly of the beast. We have learned that quiet isn't always peace and the norms and notions of what just is, isn't always justice. And yet, the dawn is ours before we knew it. For Gorman, America is, quote, a nation that isn't broken, but simply unfinished. This would seem to be counterfactual. By any reasonable account of the available evidence, America certainly appears to be pretty fractured. But Gorman's insight is this, brokenness presumes an original wholeness. You cannot put back together what was never complete to begin with. Early in her poem, Gorman transforms the and yet into an and yes, an act of voluntary consent to quote, forge our union with purpose, to compose a country committed to all cultures, colors, characters, and conditions of man. One lesson black writers and artists have taught us is that what it means to be America is to be in a constant state of making, to abide in the now and not yet quality of our national ideals. They have been calling back, they have been calling us back to an original flawed score, not simply to restore it, but in order to improvise and invent upon its founding theme, to endlessly imagine new modulations of social organization and human flourishing that are hitherto unheard and unseen, and yet recognizable for their fidelity. And yet, it remains a possibility, however dim it may appear at the moment. But its realization would require white Americans to recognize that it is those black Americans and not we ourselves who have been most faithful to the American ideal we claim to defend. Arguably, it is white Americans now most of all who are, need, who are in need of adoption into a black vision of America and not the reverse. We can only firmly assert who we 
are if that is accompanied by the recognition that we has yet to be achieved. And what if it has been realized hitherto is a twin legacy of making a nation through violence and oppression, as well as ingenuity and industry. It will never be achieved until any American still willing to claim belonging to that collective personhood confront honestly what belongs to its memory, to confront frankly who we have been and who we continue to be, a task that will have no discernible end, but which must remain a constant spiritual disposition towards truthfulness and against self-deception and the new forms of togetherness and communion that such a disposition can generate. The nation that remains to be made if there is still will enough to make it, we'll need an imagination wide enough to envision violence as unnecessary to justice and peace as something other than keeping your mouth shut. What Ralph Ellison observed in 1967 is no less true in 2021. America remains an undiscovered country. There is no real American we, not yet. Now, if this were a concert, this would be the intermission part. So if you have a water break, go for it. No, don't, not yet. It's only the first movement. Call it the end of the, you might not like the rest, so. So this is sort of the second movement of this. In a 1965 essay for Ebony Magazine, called The White Man's Guilt, James Baldwin implored, white man, hear me. History, as nearly no one seems to know, is not merely something to be read, and it does not refer merely or even principally to the past. On the contrary, the great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us, are, conscious, are unconsciously controlled by it in many ways, and history is literally present in all we do. It could scarcely be otherwise, since it is to history that we owe our frames of reference, our identities, and our aspirations. And it is with great pain and terror that one begins to realize this. In great pain and terror, one begins to assess the history which has placed one where one is and formed one's point of view in great pain and terror because thereafter one enters into battle with that historical creation, oneself, and attempts to recreate oneself according to a principle more humane and more liberating. One begins the attempt to achieve a level of personal maturity and freedom which robs history of its tyrannical power and also changes history. Baldwin's essay, which I cannot encourage you strongly enough to read because it's a powerful statement of how history is not about what you study in your classrooms at Pfeiffer University. History is who you are. Baldwin's essay is not simply a finger-pointing exercise at white folks. It is a prescient and still incisive exploration of the insight that white people it, in his time and now are, quote, aware that the history they have fed themselves is mainly a lie, but we do not know how to release ourselves from it, and we suffer enormously from the resulting personal incoherence. Baldwin's replay of the kind of objections he heard in 1965 are virtually identical to the ones one often hears today. Don't blame me, I wasn't there. Don't blame me, I voted for the other guy. White people, Baldwin argues, are so impaled, his word, on their own version of history that they have lost touch with reality and therefore with themselves. In a curious sort of remix of W.B. Du Bois's concept of double consciousness, Baldwin attributes to the white psyche a sort of duplicity, a self-induced paranoia masquerading as stability both as a personal disposition and political priority, and a deep anxiety and insecurity about the end of a certain vision of the world presenting itself as moral righteousness. On a Sunday in 2019, 
after a latish night taking in a band of seasoned session musicians at a chicken shack in Muscle Shoals, Alabama, John and I attended a midday church service in a city park at neighboring Tuscumbia. Conducted in an open air pavilion in the middle of the park, the service was being put on by a local black congregation whose members in brightly colored t-shirts sang and danced to a live gospel band and twirled streamers. It was full of the kind of energy one sees in white churches precisely never. <laughs> I'm sorry. The, the faithful on this day assembled in collapsible chairs scattered not too closely together across the spacious lawn. Many of them ate lunch from styrofoam containers bought from a local restaurant. Peckish ourselves, we took their cue and wandered behind the pavilion to a cafe in the middle of the park. After I placed my order, a large woman in a gravity-defying hairdo like a mushroom cloud came through the swinging screen door with an exaggerated huff. Y'all better look out now, she said in a voice for all to hear. They're having a demonstration in the park. Lord above, she boomed. I believe the police are on their way. There must be 10,000 people over there. About 20. White culture has possibly never had a greater satirical avatar than Nathan Thurm, the chain smoking paranoiac attorney portrayed by Martin Short for several years on SNL. Look it up on YouTube later, not now. Whose tagline was, I'm not being defensive, you're the one being defensive. Why is it always the other person being defensive? In our day, some of you will get the reference the old people. In our day, retorts of that's irrelevant or fake news or don't blame me, I voted for the other guy are not really argumentative rejoinders but as much as signifiers that I have no desire to consider this particular point with any seriousness. Moreover, I sense a potential danger to my self-image and understanding were I to do so. They are the intellectual equivalents of the roadblocks that were placed on my hometown of Atlanta in 1962 when white residents feared the incursion of black property owners into their neighborhood. They are mental signposts saying, do not enter. As Baldwin reveals, this amounts to a sort of despair, even the worst kind of despair as Soren Kierkegaard taught us, that despair which does not recognize itself as despair. I do not know how many white people read Ebony Magazine in 1965. I'm sure the answer is not many. Baldwin's message may have been lost on the very people who needed to hear it most. And while no one could in 1965 bank on white people's altruistic moral sensibilities, Baldwin could rely on their sensitivity to self-interest. Even if the motivation for justice originated in self-interest, is about, is about concern for others, Baldwin never implied that white folks just weren't up to the task. He may have had more faith in the moral constitution of white leaders of his day than they did in themselves. It has generally been the burden of people of color in this country to make their own case for equal protection under the law, to protect against political and economic injustice, and to bring white people around to good sense the logic of take it slow in the civil rights movement and inadvertently revealed a harsh truth about white America then and now. We are not capable of swift moral transformation and conversion. And the little we expect of ourselves, we also ask others to expect of us too. So in a way, it was a great compliment to white Southerners during Jim Crow when black Americans like James Baldwin demanded that white Americans come around to living up their own stated national ideals. It at least implied a confidence that those white folks had it in them somewhere to pull it off. Now I get that it's not easy hearing this stuff on a Monday morning. It's probably one reason why it was never taught to me in school. I went to an excellent high school in Atlanta where I was never assigned to read James Baldwin nor Du Bois, who wrote some of his most important work while he was a professor in Atlanta. From Baldwin, I learned, among other things, how much damage white people like me have done to ourselves from our own willful amnesia. From Du Bois, I learned how much damage we had done to black lives through that same paranoia about impending loss of control. 
Standing on the backside of the state capitol in Atlanta, Georgia, 2018, I encountered a monument to an episode I'd never learned about in school. A moment in 1868 when 33 newly seated black legislators were summarily removed from their elected positions by the state assembly. From Du Bois, I later learned how my own ancestor, Milton Candler, had initiated the plan in the Georgia Senate. It is one of the miracles of literature that a black writer from Massachusetts who died in Ghana in 1963 can tell me something about myself that no one in my family ever knew, and pro or had the courage to tell, and possibly proof that markers to historical episodes some of us would like to forget can help us to reassemble fragments that we had lost or forsaken into selves that are more whole. So when John Hayes and I returned to the road in 2018, after a short hiatus, 14 years, I don't know if that's short or not, we took along with us new traveling companions, Du Bois, Baldwin. They were like hitchhikers who kept reappearing on the side of the road, begging to come aboard, and as if they had something urgent, but not necessarily new, to tell us. The irony, of course, is that they became my guides, mentors who helped me to see the absence of markers to some of the more consequential episodes in our nations, my cities, and my own history. And what is more, gave me an opportunity to see in those blank spaces that something had intentionally been forfeited. I'll give you, that's just, that's a, it's a fork in the road <laughs> in Miriam. I don't know if Scott recognizes that one. Um, but here are a few examples of what I'm talking about. Um, from my travels over the years. You probably all know the Lorraine Motel, maybe not this particular image of it. Uh, the Lorraine Motel is where Martin Luther King spent his last night. He was assassinated on April 4th, 1968 uh, at a balcony at the Lorraine Motel. Recently, the, a monument to the 1866 Memphis Massacre, as it's called, uh, used to be called a race riot, but uh, it's now a better called just a massacre because it happened in the wake of the first ma major civil rights, re civil rights legislation at the, at the federal government after the Civil War, the 1866 Civil Rights Act. It's a long story, but, the, but uh, dozens of black men were murdered in the Memphis Massacre. Now this is not a good picture, it's a terrible photograph, but this is a, just to give you a perspective of where that marker stands in relationship to the Lorraine Motel. It's not 300 feet distance separating the site of the most notorious massacre of black men in Memphis's history that most people in Memphis either don't know about or won't talk about, it's like a hundred yards from where King was assassinated 102 years later. It makes it, it gives you a sense of how, how far or how far, far our country has not progressed in that space of time. I believe the proximity of American history, American ideals and that practice is best encountered on foot. This is an example of one of those cases. The Bryant's Grocery in Money, Mississippi, where Emmett Till was accused of whistling at Carolyn Bryant and then lynched, brutally thrown into his body, thrown into the Tallahatchie River. The structure of Bryant's Grocery, there is a marker to it. But get this, the owner of this building is asking, it's falling in to the ground and it probably will, it's only a matter of time before it's just a, a heap of bricks. Uh, the owner is asking $40 million for this future pile of bricks. Uh, but not only that, he was, he's dead now, but his descendants own the building. The guy who originally bought it was a foreman on the all-white jury that, can, that acquitted Emmett Till's murderer. 
Next door, by the way, I don't have a photograph of it because it's so, in, so uninteresting. This is not it. But next door to Bryant's Grocery is an old gas station, like one of those SO gas stations that's been made up to, sort of been restored to its 1950s glory. It looks like something you'd see in American graffiti, at which I realize no one in this room, apart from a few people, will, will, will know what that is. Um, it's an old movie about 1750s. Greece, maybe? Anybody know Greece? No? No one? Okay. Um, anyway, right next to Brian's Grocery is this restored old gas station meant to evoke the nostalgia of that period when America was supposedly great, the 1950s, which was the period when Emmett Till was lynched. But it's, it looks brand new. The same family owns the Bryant's, Bryant's Grocery and owns the restored gas station. Just to give you an idea of the way memory in America works, what we like to remember, the memories we want to dress up and cover with a new coat of paint, and the ones we would prefer to let return to the ground, unless $40 million is on offer. This is a scene from the bank of the Tallahatchie River where Emmett Till's body was discovered in September of 1955. There is a marker to this site. It's been put up by the Emmett Till, um, the, the Emmett Till Remembrance Project, I think it's called, I forget the name of it now, um, based in Sumner, Mississippi. And they put up a marker identifying this site. It's now encased in bulletproof glass because it's been shot up so many times by local uh, white people. Uh, this one's almost too dark for this morning, but this is the barn where Till was actually m murdered. It is so remote, you have to know somebody who knows how to get there. It is on private property, it's just an unmarked barn, but the, the unspeakable violence of what happened in this room is almost just too much to bear. There is, of course, nothing to indicate the site. Um, in a cemetery in Monroe, Georgia, one of four victims of one of the last mass lynchings in the United States in 1946. Four black, uh, two black couples. Monroe is south of Athens, Georgia. It's called the Moore's Ford lynching. One of the four victims is buried in uh, an un otherwise unmarked cemetery in an office park in Monroe. Um, that event led to the 1948 Civil Rights Act. This is a park bench in Ellington, South Carolina. Ellington was the site of a, a, uh, a racial massacre in 1876. If any historians here are familiar with the Hamburg Massacre in 1876 that led to the transformation of Southern politics, a return of the uh, white planter class to power in South Carolina, the end of Reconstruction in 1877. It had a lot to do with what happened in Hamburg, at which I think six black men were, were, were murdered by red shirts, which were the successors of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, and there actually is a, a museum to the red shirts in Edgefield, South Carolina. But Ellington was the site of a massacre even more deadly than Hamburg. Over 100 black men were killed in Ellington. The town is no longer there. It's completely gone. The uh, Savannah River uh, plant, part of the dark, part of energy, uh, took over the site in the 1950s, and there's all that remains is a, as a marker on the side of the road that makes no mention of the Ellington massacre. Denmark Vesey was a was a pastor in Charleston, South Carolina who in 1822 uh, proposed, he encouraged local black residents to rise up against white uh, planter class in Charleston and, and he, in, you know, to effect a violent insurrection, take over the city of Charleston. And um, this is Second Presbyterian Church in Charleston, South Carolina, across from what is Marion Square, where there used to be a big monument to John C. Calhoun. Uh, after the uprising, well, 
Zizi was, was uh, baptized in this church. He then founded a church. He was one of the founders of a church called Mother Emmanuel AME Church, which you probably have heard of as a site of the massacre of nine black churchgoers in 2019, 2015, excuse me. Uh, Vizi, was a, that was his church. His son, Robert, was the architect. Um, anyway, he was baptized here. So this church was associated with Denmark Vizi. Across the street, after Vizi's attempted uprising in 1822, the city of Charleston established a basically a military school and an arsenal, which they set up across the street from this church. That arsenal is now known as the Citadel. It's South Carolina's premier military institution. Its origins go back to the Denmark Vesey uprising. And a small island in the middle of Ashley Avenue in Charleston, north of where I just pointed out, there is an oak tree growing for some reason in the middle of the street. It has been preserved. There's no reason, there, or there's no indication of why the city hasn't just torn this oak tree down, made, made it a more sensible traffic pattern. Allegedly, according to oral tradition, this is the site, not the actual tree, but the site from which Denmark Vesey was hanged in 1822. These are the church doors on Mother Emanuel AME where the assassin uh, entered. I think that you probably get the point. So I, I will show you what there is a monument to. However, in Northwest Alabama, there's a monument to the coon dog. Uh, there is a graveyard in northeast of northwest of Florence, Alabama, devoted to uh, dogs trained to hunt raccoons. And this is the great monument, the coon dog monument. I could go on, but I think you get the picture. These absences and presences reveal what it is we choose to remember, what we choose, the stories we choose to tell about ourselves. In American myth-making, there is a, posit a positive obsession with innocence and a negative obsession with guilt. We love the former and have a great talent for telling stories about our own innocence. We hate the latter, but cannot seem to get away from it because we cannot seem to put our collective finger on what the source of our guilt really is. For example, you're likely to encounter the concept of guilt, and maybe the experience of it in the candy aisle of your local mega grocery mart or on regu regular television spots telling you that you can now enjoy those things you really want without the guilt. Think, for example, of the brand No Evil Foods, based where I live in Asheville. It's designed to assuage the guilty consciences of American shoppers who, at least in this case, actually have enough of a conscience to feel guilty. Entire dieting regimens and lifestyle programs are premised on the idea that you can have what you want, but without the nagging feeling of doing something that you shouldn't have. This is a trivial example, but it leaves the que raises the question of whether or not you should want what you want or even the deeper question of whether or not you know yourself well enough to know what it is you truly want to begin with. But this isn't what I mean by guilt. Eating a t deliciously tempting dessert high in saturated fats and cholesterol may be bad for you, but it is not necessarily a moral failure. It might be just symptomatic of how distorted our conver national conversation about moral failure really is. I'm looking at the time, so I'm gonna jump ahead just a little bit. We should, as individuals and collectives, play, pay close attention to the stories we tell about ourselves. I admit to being an American exceptionalist in one sense. We are exceptionally bad at memory and honest self-reflection. Baldwin said that we Americans, quote, have a deep-seated distrust of real intellectual effort, probably because we suspect that it will destroy as I hope it does, that myth of America to which we cling so desperately. When Du Bois and Baldwin came aboard this journey, they joined up with a fellow traveler, St. Augustine of Hippo, who wrote in the fourth century that, our love for truth takes the form that we love something else and want this object of our love to be the truth, 
And because we do not wish to be deceived, we do not wish to be persuaded that we are mistaken. And so we hate the truth for the sake of the object which we love instead of the truth, i.e. our self-image. We love the truth for the light it sheds, but hate it when it shows, up, shows us up as being wrong. Among its cultured despisers, but perhaps even more so among its adherents, Christianity has a rather embarrassing reputation for guilt obsession. But it also reminds us annually that it is not remiss to consider guilt a positive good. In the ancient Easter proclamation from the Latin rite, the exultant, it's one of the most beautiful hymns in the Christian tradition, describes the guilt of Adam as felix, or happy. Well, to think of sin as somehow happy has given rise to some very highly dubious and troubling theologies that would make evil somehow necessary. The context of the exalted is instructive. We sing this in the dark of night, that moment when despair seems to have won. For hope to be real and authentic hope, it has to be able to entertain the possibility that all is in fact lost. It is worth pausing to consider whether or not the frank consideration of our own collective and individual guilt might not also be generative of something deeper and more real, even more hopeful. Redemption, if it can be earned at all, certainly cannot be won on the cheap. Guilt can certainly be oppressive to those who cannot see their way out of it, but it can also be especially salutary for those who embrace it in order to resist its totalizing power. I cannot ultimately fault anyone for not wanting to descend into the dank and demogorgon infested basement. Okay, did anybody get that reference? Dang, strike it out here, okay. Demogorgon infested basement of the house of American story to sit for very long with what Bear, Wendell Berry calls, at last, with our real selves in the real world. It can be terrifying which is probably why the practice of willful amnesia became so endemic by my generation. As Flannery O'Connor wrote in 1955, there are long periods in the lives of all of us and of the saints when the truth as revealed by faith is hideous, emotionally disturbing, and downright repulsive. But as O'Connor also taught us, all human nature vigorously resists grace because grace changes us and change is painful. If there is hope for America, it will require a quite possibly otherworldly confidence to say yes to the we to which generations of black poets have been calling us for a long time. And whatever promise remains in the American experiment consists largely and henceforth in a commitment to truthfulness, even and especially when it hurts. But we have nothing to lose but our idols. Not that forsaking them will be easy. As Bob Dylan sings, the things you have the hardest time parting with are the things you need the least. This is true of the idols of our historical mythologies, which are possessive of our loyalties and jealous of our affection and do not take kindly to being demoted. The great genius of idols is to convince us that we need them. But we do not need them, we never did, and we will begin to learn how much better off we are when we yield them up to dissolution in order that something true might take its place. This is ultimately what a commitment to truthfulness, excuse me. Um, for me, shooting film on the road is one means of unlearning the untruths that formed my intellectual diet from a young age. It has become for me a sort of spiritual exercise, an intentionally slow and even mistake-prone practice that returns more than I can give it. But as the great photographer Robert Adams once wrote, though poems and pictures cannot by themselves save anyone, only people who care for each other face to face have a chance to do that. They can strengthen our resolve to agree to life. This is ultimately what a commitment to truthfulness amounts to, an assent to life. The fact that we are all here this morning, face to face in this gymnasium, means that this is actually a real possibility. You have, by your presence here this morning, even if your teachers forced you to be here, 
shown up in favor of our common life and our common future. You have cast your ballot in favor of that which any university is supposed to lead you into, a happy life, which, as Augustine said, is simply joy grounded in truth. I think this is also true of America. The pursuit of happiness is identical with the pursuit of truthfulness. If we're going to say, go on saying we, then it will require us to ask some basic questions of ourselves, like, where am I? But this is a thrilling opportunity, not a debilitating one, because fundamental questions about who we are and what it means to be human are the highest expression of human nature, since they require a response that measures the depth of an individual's commitment to his own existence. To assent to truthfulness is to say yes to your own existence, to cast a vote in favor of life. It will be challenging, and we will lose only something we didn't really need in the process. But ultimately, the promise of confronting American guilt is that it can communicate a pe peculiar but essential kind of grace, the grace of being told the truth. Thank you so much for being here. I really do appreciate you all uh, being here today, making the choice to be here and to engage in, in what, no doubt, and I will speak for me and not for we, a thought-provoking exercise. This is the spirit of our intent of, of this lecture series. Um, Dr. Candler will be here for a little bit. Um, if you uh, want to come in and say hey and engage with him, uh, for students and community members, uh, we'll reconvene in the Harris Lecture Hall at 2 o'clock. Um, and there, if you have direct Q&A opportunities about um, uh, what Dr. Candler shared with you today, or just about his uh, life as a writer, photographer, podcaster, uh, we'll entertain that conversation when we gather. So all are welcome there as well. Uh, thank you so much for your time this morning.